Hi, everyone. We've managed to get as many people on, on stage as we could get chairs, so that, that's the first part. We also had some last-minute swaps, and it's going to be pretty interesting. The whole idea of what we're doing today, and especially if you're watching this at home, is FreeBSD has been around for a very long time. One of the biggest challenges is getting more new platforms, and I know we have people in the audience that are far newer companies than the people you see on stage, um, and are looking at how do we leverage FreeBSD Again, as a new platform, not thinking, what did we do 20 years ago? Going forward, why should you use it? Why should you consider it? And I wanted to bring this panel of incredibly intelligent people that have worked with FreeBSD as part of large companies and, and sort of talk through that experience of what, what does it mean, how does it work, uh, what are some of the challenges you've seen, and especially what are some forward-looking statements? What challenges do you see in the future? We have this embedded world, we have IoT, we have any number of things. How does FreeBSD fit into all of that? And if you're a total newbie at FreeBSD, why should you trust that this is a good solution for you? Why should it be competing with other choices of operating systems? So we've co I've covered already a little bit of what we want to talk about today. The more pointed questions will be around um, OS for future platforms, um, how do you leverage it, what are the challenges and opportunities, and most importantly, and Alan touched on this before, how do you get started in the community, right? Because with every open source project, you probably want to be a bit of a part of it. You probably need to upstream some of your code. You need to do certain things. So if you're completely on the outside, how do you get started? Who do we have on this panel? We have me, I'm just a moderator, I'm letting better people talk. I'm um, together with Alan, I started Clara Inc. Uh, we have Alex from NetApp, just any word you want to say about yourself? No. Got it. Got it. <laughs> we, have, we, have, <laughs> we have Andy Waffa from, from ARM. I think he's spoken plenty of these, conference, of these conferences, previous panel of mine as well on ARM technologies. Uh, we have a very, very last minute entry from, from Netscaler Technologies that's gonna talk again about how FreeBSD is integrated in, in, in the technology. We have Simon from Juniper, and we have, again, Alan, my partner in crime. Uh, and now, you know, we're not going to go to the thank you slide. We can move away from watching the screen, and we're going to start by, you know, what's, what's in general your experience with running, running your mega platform on, on FreeBSD? Alex, how's, what's NetApp's experience with this? A very broad question. <laughs> um, I think overall, FreeBSD provides a very solid foundation for any platform because it has a proven history of being stable, secure, performant, um, which then allows companies like NetApp to, to add their own IP and, and sell value to customers without having to, you know, reinvent the wheel. Dor, I think you had a bit of an idea how, you know, you want to talk a little bit through how, how, how Netscaler got started with FreeBSD and where you are right now. <clears throat> sure. Um, is it okay if I stand up? Go for it. There's okay. no rules. Um, so I, I've never had a chance to address you folks, but I want to express our gratitude to the FreeBSD community. Um, <clears throat> I, have, I have two relationships to the FreeBSD community. I have an academic, historical academic relationship and a commercial relationship. I taught at Santa Clara in the Graduate School of Engineering for about three decades. And uh, thanks to you know, very kind help from uh, Mr. Makuzic, uh, we had a course that I taught for 10 years at Santa Clara. It was called Unix Kernel Internals. I taught it off of the FreeBSD uh, code base because I'm not qualified to do the same course in Linux. Um, I joined the Netscaler in 2000. Um, Netscaler was founded in 1998. The original choice of FreeBSD, which was 225, um, was based on intellectual property issues. The Netscaler started out as a um, uh, packet engine, basically a high-performance packet scribbler with an in-kernel implementation in FreeBSD 225. I've been responsible for FreeBSD since I joined Netscaler in 2000. We ported from 225 to 4.4 to 4.9 to 6.3 to 8.4 to 11.4. I did all of those open source ports except for 4.9 because I was away from the company um, for a while. Um, and then I came back. So almost all of those OS upgrades are mine. Uh, I have um, some of our team members are in here. Um, frequent attendee uh, Steve Jacobson right here in the front is one of our um, Nick Driver experts and a, um, 
uh, is involved with um, some different interesting stuff on the web with FreeBSD. And, um, uh, you know, what we've seen in terms of our product, and by the way, if you're not familiar with the Netscaler, we're, we're a load balancer and packet scribbler. Um, we've fronted large hunks of the internet for um, many, uh, you know, the past quarter century. Um, and we continue to innovate um, and compete successfully today. Uh, FreeBSD is one of the uh, four essential elements of our success. There were four decisions that were made in the late 90s as to why Netscaler is still in business today. And one of those decisions was the decision to use FreeBSD. Uh, FreeBSD, every version of FreeBSD in our environment has been a success. And, um, you know, that's not just, you know, my personal victory. That's a victory of the community and the quality that gets produced in this baseline. Um, I was just mentioning to somebody, you know, I I'm, I'm have deep entanglement with um, field escalations for our product. Um, there's never been more than one FreeBSD bug, true FreeBSD bug. There's never been more than one in all that journey of 25 years. We've never had more than one bug that was, could manifest in our product that was really a FreeBSD bug at a time. Okay, and we've been through all this journey with you guys. And um, now, uh, you know, in the environment we're in today, um, you know, there are people who come to us because obviously something that's been in business for 25 years, we have a lot of turnover, we have a lot of new people coming in, and um, people who themselves do not work on code, many of whom never work on code, come to me, come to us and say, well, why aren't you on Linux? Right? Why aren't you? And, the, <laughs> well, the answer to that question is, um, you know, we have very deep roots in FreeBSD, um, but um, for many of these people, and again, there's more pressure for, um, from that for people who have never themselves written code or certainly never touched any code for a long time. You know, they, they kind of have this Linux envy. They, you know, they go to their wine tasting parties and they're embarrassed in front of their friends because it runs on FreeBSD and it doesn't run on Linux. You know, and so they, you know, then they come to work and they manifest their embarrassment to ask. And, and you know, it's a, just this... And, and by the way, when we do an upgrade, like the one we did in two, 2021, we went to FreeBSD 11.4, and it takes us two years. Um, we started with 11.2, we then transitioned to 11.3, and then we went to 11.4, and, um, uh, and, then, and then we merge, and you know, you know, we can only lock our tree for a few days. It took us seven days this time. Usually it takes us three um, to turn over our baseline. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a massive effort, and, um, uh, and you know, personally, I've had a goal to extinguish and eliminate our customizations. Our customizations have obviously gotten, we've gotten a much smaller footprint of customizations over the years. Um, but um, for many of the people on the other side of the fence advocating for Linux, they're actually living in a fantasy world, because they, them, them, the people who advocate for this don't themselves understand code. And, um, you know, they see this Linux, right? And it's, they don't realize that, well, what is FreeBSD? FreeBSD in a Linux context is actually a complete distro, right? So when you step into the world of Linux, the first thing you have to say is, well, which Linux, right? And, and one, another thing is, like, if you go back 25 years to when we started, there is nothing that we could be on today that existed in 1998 that we could be using except FreeBSD, right? There's nothing else we could use today. There's nothing in the Linux world. And oh, by the way, you know, I was involved in a startup before I got to Netscaler that was um, <clears throat> in the Linux world. Um, you know, I've seen friends, I've seen, you know, I've known people with products in that community. If you're wrong in the Linux world, you are dead. Okay. Well, I, and I, I, I certainly hope there's a bit of a step back around that. No, it's true. I mean, <laughs> if, if, if you're late to the party with Linux, you're dead. Because I've been involved in people who, who, who had that experience. If you're wrong on the packaging, Linux will always have better, cooler packaging that we have. They have fads, they come and go. If you're wrong with the packaging, you're dead. And you've got a big in engineering investment in something that doesn't exist and doesn't have traction. And I've seen this pattern over and over again. And people just completely gloss over that, 
right? The, 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 the Linux bigots completely gloss over these details. So for them, it's like a fantasy world. We wish we were on the other side, and we're not. Well, but I, FreeBSD, in the meantime, is working. And we have never, technically, we have never regretted being on FreeBSD for any, even one day. I, I think I'd want to stop a little bit on that note and sort of ask, um, turn that interestingly to NetApp, because you guys have definitely taken advantage of any number of features from FreeBSD. Can you talk a little bit more about what's, what's been steadfast for you throughout the years, and why is it, why is it that I'm sure you've been at any point in time asked that question of why do you guys run on FreeBSD and not on Linux, and what made you not necessarily stay but continue with FreeBSD, because it's not a stagnation thing. Yeah, no, nothing, nothing stays the same. Um, I think with, with most vendors on FreeBSD, you know, when we were choosing where to go, licensing plays a big part. Uh, having a, a permissive license obviously helps when you're trying to make money from the product. Not the only way to do it, but it helps. From there, the ability to integrate our core IP into an OS allows us to, to very seamlessly take advantage of the rest of the ecosystem. We can, uh, in developing, obviously, a, a, a network file server for very simple terms of it, right? Performance is everything. Mm. And being able to know that our underlying network stack, which we have to modify for our own IP and you know, multi-tenancy purposes, we know it's still going to be performant as it's been proven through so many other vendor uses as well. Um, so when it comes down to why do we need to keep staying on it, well, we have not had a reason to leave, right? It's our ability to, to really tune the, the, like you're saying, distribution for our needs has proven time and time again to be exactly what we need. Um, and then you pair that with a community that is always supporting and we are, you know, companies like Clara, or just the developer, uh, you know, volunteer community. It's not lagging in any way. We are always still, you know, staying up with the state of art, um, if not pushing it uh, ourselves as a project. And so that continues to again foster more innovation and allow us to keep pushing forward. I think I'm going to move the question to Simon as well, because I think you guys have been in a very similar situation at some point. And I'm sure somebody, especially in higher management, has challenged you at any point in time to move to Linux. And how has that, how uh, has that changed, or how did, you, how did you navigate that? Uh, well, essentially, we lost. Um, so we, very similar to what Do was saying, we, we, I joined Juniper in 2000. Um, We've been using FreeBSD uh, very successfully um, since the late 90s. Um, it's worked very well for us. Uh, the main problem that we've had um, as we develop new, especially low-end platforms, uh, where you're basically taking SOCs from uh, vendors, chip vendors, who for the most part provide either zero documentation about their chips and their peripherals and so on, or if they provide you anything at all, they provide you a reference Linux driver. Um, and for the people within the company who are not part of the FreeBSD uh, religion, um, they, they look at this problem, they say, well, like, why are we spending all this time and effort to, you know, writing drivers for, for FreeBSD when we can just go and take all these drivers that come for free with the, the the chip from the vendor. And we, we had a very contentious debate over this um, many years ago. And you know, some of us would point out that, yes, it is true that you get you know, chip A from vendor A, and you get a driver that works with it. These are rarely fully functional drivers. They're more like proof of concept drivers. And yes, and that driver typically comes with you know, 500 patches to the Linux kernel that you need in order for that driver to work. And then you have chip B from vendor B, which comes with its 
own 500 patches to the Linux kernel, which may be a different version of the Linux kernel. Um, and so in theory, you can throw all this stuff together and it, quote, just magically works. And, and therefore, you don't have to be a, quote, operating system company, um, which is uh, not, a, not, not a very wise position to take. But the, the fact is that we have some very large customers who don't like the fact that, you know, their routing products are not identical to their server products, and they'd like to just think of all the world as a rack of, you know, um, uh, fungible, you know, compute assets, regardless of what they're doing. Um, we see this coming from a number of uh, customers where uh, there are, I think, Amazon, is it? Amazon want to do the, like, white box things where, you know, look, your, your hardware is too expensive, we'll, we'll just do the hardware ourselves, just give us the, the routing protocols and stuff like that and, and so on. And a lot of this stuff, you know, it all sounds good in, in theory, it doesn't necessarily, you know, work well in practice, but you, unfortunately when, when you've got large customers that pay you lots of money, you can't really tell them that, sorry, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard, you know, don't have children. Um, and so you, you have to sort of like play nice. Um, and so what's happened to us is, you know, FreeBSD still makes us, uh, makes our products work. Um, but unfortunately, we, we've got a, quite an ingress of Linux, and not just Linux, but like multiple versions of it. Uh, I think we have one product which has six different versions, uh, six different operating systems on the one product for various reasons which I can't explain. Um, so FreeBSD has been very good for us. It's, I mean, I've, I've thankfully been able to um, ignore the, the Linux side of the house and, and hopefully I can retire before that's forced on me. Um, but FreeBSD has been very good to us. Uh, it's a good community to work with. We find that, you know, uh, when we want to do crazy things like add, you know, verifying very exec, as it were, to the loader and so on. Um, we don't meet uh, you know, ridiculous resistance and so on. And in fact, there's there's a number of people who are interested in exactly the same things that we want to do because, you know, the, the world is not the the nice place that it was when the Morris Worm came about. Um, and so, make it, one of the things that I've done most of my time at Juniper is is making the boxes more secure. Um, and the FreeBSD community being very open to, to taking, you know, any of that sort of stuff that we can upstream. Uh, whereas, if, if we were a Linux shop, we would find ourselves in, in very, um, what's the word, in a very different situation. Where, well, the attitude that we often see there is, you know, you, we come up with this thing, hey, we've got this fantastic thing, uh, it's called Verified Executive Does This, and they'll say, ah, well, it can't be any good because if it was if it was good, it would already be in Linux, and therefore, it can't be any good. And like, you you can't have a rational conversation with that premise. Um, so I, I I don't see the the Linux aspect of things working out too well uh, in the long run. So we'll we're just the the FreeBSD team are just um, plotting ahead. I mean, we'll be running FreeBSD for a very long time yet. Um, and uh, hopefully sanity will prevail. I think I, I was looking at Andy's small chuckle there with this, hopefully sanity will prevail. You had a lot of experience working with different communities. How does it look from, you know, ARM side? Because you yourself don't run a product on FreeBSD platforms, but there's any number of people in the audience that might want to do something with FreeBSD and ARM. What do you have to tell to them? What's, what's your take on this? Yeah, so I'm... Um I'm having to be careful with what I say, so no, I don't no, so, so, so I don't ruin my presentation tomorrow. That's all. So, but if you want to hear more about what ARM no, does with FreeBSD, uh, <laughs> check out my talk tomorrow morning. Um, but yeah, I think I mean one aspect that I can uh, say is that I'm relatively new to FreeBSD, and so much I've only been engaged with FreeBSD for about a decade. That's new. Or so. Um, considering I've been in open source for almost 25 years, it's relatively new. We, we right? shouldn't be talking about that. <laughs> <either. laughs> um, 
but my first interaction with the community was actually at a vendor summit uh, in 20, 2012, I think it was. Um, and it was a real eye-opener for me. I've been involved in Linux and, and other open source communities for a number of years, and it was all great. But the, the demographics of the community, it is an exceptionally diverse community. Um, the, you know, the, the structure of things, it's nice, flat, it's nice and easy. Um, it was literally two direct competitors, one after the other were talking about a feature that they wanted to see happen, and they're both like, oh, light bulb moment. You want that, I want that, how about we just ride it, okay. And there and then, during the event, they were riding this feature that they both wanted direct competitors and like, eh, whatever. Um, it just gave that nice gooey feeling, right? Um, there is something to be said for that. Um, it is a very stable community. Um, and, you know, as a software platform, it is pretty rock solid, right? Um, in tech, nothing is new, right? VMs, yeah, IBM did that in 63. Uh, you know, containers, yeah, IBM did that in 65. None of this stuff is new, right? It's just got a new set of lenses on it to make it look shiny. So, but FreeBSD has been very consistent. It's kind of shirked off these fads, etc. It's just kept true straight path. I know a number of um, Linux maintainers, they have the utmost respect for FreeBSD um, and the community and how it all works, uh, as well as the other you know, sister BSDs uh, on top of that. Um, the fact that you do have other d BSD variants that do work together, that do talk to each other most of the time, right? Uh, probably more so than some of the Linux community, right? Mm -hmm. um, it is just a really solid, stable platform to move forward. I'm not saying it's perfect. It's not really in the embedded space yet, which I would love to see more of. Um, but there's growth opportunity, right? The embedded space is huge, so there's plenty of room for everyone. So FreeBSD can absolutely make a, a mark there. So that's kind of what I'm holding out for. So what are some of the challenges you can speak to that you see? Well, you've talked about embedded space. Can you go a little bit deeper into that and say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, I, I, have, I make any sort of embedded chips. I'd like this to work with FreeBSD. What's the, what's some, what are some of the issues that I'm gonna encounter when I do this? So kind of um, reiterating the point that was made where a lot of SOC vendors are, um, not well educated enough in making sure that drivers, etc., are done properly. Uh, you know, they run against old versions with large patch sets, etc. So having to backport, you know, even in the Linux space, it's a pain in the backside, right? Uh, so how how can the community educate some of these enterprises as to look? If you're going to do it, do it right from the outset, and then everyone can benefit, including yourself. Right? Um, that's a key factor. R historically, FreeBSD has always had aspects of its platform pilfered and integrated into other things. As an example, in, in the embedded and automotive space, QNX, who are a massive player, they, you know, they uh, took the FreeBSD network stack. Right, and integrate it into their product. They didn't really interact with FreeBSD or anything. They're like, hmm, that works well. We'll have that, right? And to this day, they're still using BSD network stack with very little give back. It's a shame. Part of the benefit of the license. Um, but yeah, I mean, FreeBSD owns the gaming market. People will argue with you. It's like the only major gaming platform that FreeBSD is not on is the um, Steam Deck, right? 
it's on PlayStation, it's on Switch. What more do you want, right? So it owns that market. Um, so it is kind of making it in there. It's just really slow. And part of the licensing means that we won't necessarily know about it until it's done dusted. Well, I, I think it's also a very quiet, because you're not, you, you don't have to release whether you use it or not. You have this ability to hide into the background. Many, many new participants in the community are surprised to find out, which is also why this panel exists. Like, yes, these are a company that daily leverage free BSD. As you said, Sony, for, for a lot of their gaming platform, like, did you know that when you play on your PlayStation, you're not actually running a Linux distro? Did you know that you're actually running on a, on a BSD distro? And you know, half the time the reaction will be, what's BSD? Especially since we're talking in 2023, and a lot of this is starting to move further and further away from what people know about systems in the end. That's, I think that's one of the challenges that we can address immediately. We, the FreeBSD Foundation, together as a community, as a group, is this presence, this this is more present than you think and you know, and this is more flexible than you know. Also, please tell us about it when you use it so we can tell other people about the good news and the fact that it's, again, it, it can serve its purpose. But on the challenges note, Alex, what's your, what kind of challenges did you encounter over the years, more recently, of, from using FreeBSD? Like, where do where you feel like, oh, if this would only work better? I think that trying to integrate some third-party projects causes a lot of angst. And that may not be due to FreeBSD. It might just be the third-party project itself. but. Sometimes we find, you know, hey, we want to use a, a new library to do X, Y, and Z, and so we go and take that. It's like, okay, look, it, it says it supports FreeBSD. Awesome, let's bring it over. Oh, we're on an older version of FreeBSD, so now we got to patch in the things we need. Okay, no problem. And now we're hitting bugs that aren't reported anywhere else. Why are we hitting bugs? And it's because the FreeBSD version wasn't tested well enough. Okay, well now that means we're doing more qualification efforts just to bring in what should be free because it's open source, someone else did it. But uh, one of my coworkers loves to say that, you know, open source is free like a puppy is free, right? There's still work to do. Um, it's free puppy, not free beer. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I think that's where we've seen a lot of uh, more friction in, in just the use of FreeBSD because perhaps if we were running on a Linux distro, we use that third party software and it works a lot better because there are enough users that have tested it and reported the issue. Um, Outside of that, it's kind of the same thing that you've been mentioning, like, okay, you got to do more work to get a device driver to, to fully function within your, your BSD. Um, but that's, I don't, I wouldn't say that FreeBSD is necessarily harder to work with because of that. Do you feel like that's gotten better or worse over the years? Honest question, that's an honest battle. Yeah, from my perspective, and you know, I, I'm a, I work in up, but these are my personal opinion here. Um, I don't see it as being harder um, now than it has been in the past. I also don't do that work directly. Uh, my focus at NetApp is to maintain the, the base system of FreeBSD and try to bring that up to date. But I don't, I'm not the subject matter expert in all the different areas. You know, we have our networking folks and driver folks that own all the different areas. Um, and so when it comes to bringing in new devices, I have to go and ask someone else if they feel like it's gotten easier or harder. Uh, my gut reaction is it's been about the same. Mm. Alan, maybe can you speak a little bit to some of the challenges we've seen with some of our customers? Like, wh what are some of the things that customers keep coming back with or some of the yeah. issues that... I think uh, one of the biggest ones is, is, I think as almost everybody in the panel's experience, when you're basing your product on a version of FreeBSD, you usually end up targeting you know, a release or a stable branch, and it turns out, well, that's already a year or two behind when you started developing the product. So by the time you release it, you're even further behind. And helping vendors with the process of getting caught up to mainline and developing a process to actually stay there uh, because the rapid iteration, you know, being able to, if you're close to upstream, then you can stay there and the amount of work each iteration is, is, is much, much smaller and doesn't turn into a, a two-year effort to go from you know, 9.x to 11.x or whatever, and knowing that you know, 11's been EOL for a while and it's time to go to 14, and, and that's, knowing that's another two years of effort is, is another difficulty. 
Uh, but I will highlight some of the advantages as well. Like Simon was saying, getting stuff upstream in other operating systems uh, usually is a lot more difficult and oftentimes you run into a roadblock. Like we saw even EU network researchers develop a, a new protocol extension and they tried to upstream it to Linux and they're told, well, you know, the maintainer of that subsystem works at Google and Google has their own thing and they're gonna upstream it a year from now so we're just not interested in your patch. And then FreeBSD is like, sure. And then after a short amount of time, it's integrated and part of FreeBSD. Can I be a bit pointy and ask mm -hmm. whether if FreeBSD would be as big as Linux, would we have the same issues? I know I'm putting yeah. you on the spot. Yeah. Um, partly no because of the, the structure of FreeBSD. There's no maintainer who has one person who has a final say on which version of a thing we're going to use. It would be a more collaborative effort to decide which version to use. And the one we can have right now versus this mythical one that's a year or more away would be harder to make the case for, but maybe that case could be made. But it would be a discussion in the community, not one person just being like, no. And So and, if I'm trying to convince a Linux committer to come over to the other side, it's like, do you want to feel more? Part of the process. Part of the proce process, and like you, you can actually contribute without being gatekept at every point. That, that mm -hmm. would be a sort of selling point. Yes. Uh, not that there's not a lot more FreeBSD could do to lower the barriers to entry and make it easier for people to contribute, but my feeling is we're further ahead than some of the other projects already. Well, I think barriers of entry are to an extent necessary because you yeah. also want code quality. I mean, one of the reasons why the entire panel isn't saying we're running into bugs every week or th everything is on fire all the time is because quality control is very important and having a bunch of smart people to check this is part of our process. <laughs> Dora, you wanted to say something about the challenges. Yeah, I, I just want to clarify, <clears throat> why does it take me to port, an, uh, why, do, why does it take me two years to do an OS upgrade? So we have, we have a unified code base. We produce um, up to half a dozen different binary products from that unified code base. We build from the operating system. Every single build we do is all the, has an integrated copy of the operating system from the ground up. Um, the reason it's, and it's like, last time I checked, it's 67 million lines of code in our code base. And um, uh, <clears throat> the reason it takes us two years, um, most of that time is spent getting a clean build. Because we're jumping between, uh, like last time we went from GCC 4.x to Clang. And um, so we're running into you know, build issues. Meanwhile, I've got 500 developers on the old tool chain who are re-injecting the same kind of incompatibilities into a living code base, right? So I'm constantly cycling through, you know, you know, pushing the right version of the code that's portable back onto people. And, you know, it, I mean, you could say, well, why don't you just tell them to build it in a portable way? And it's like, it's hopeless, right? There's 500 people, they're all under pressure to write code. So, um, but we can't, we literally can't, um, <clears throat> uh, we can't keep up with the velocity of FreeBSD the way we, we'd like to. Um, you know, maybe 14. It's, it's, uh, it's a reasonably common challenge in the yeah. sense that we, we've seen this across the field and um, Alan, you wanted to add something to that? No, I just, um, like I think another thing that vendors need to look at in general, especially when deciding on a platform to base on is we don't want the whole industry to become a monoculture around Linux, right? We need there to be alternatives for everything, right? Whether that's the actual operating system layer, but also the libraries, right? If the library you're trying to choose has to compete with another library to have support for FreeBSD, there's more likelihood that there's going to be that, and we don't end up with problems like OpenSSL, where when there's a vulnerability, it turns out everybody in the world is affected by it, right? If we can avoid having monocultures at the OS and the library and the application layer, it, that, that diversity is a strength of open source, but it's only a strength of open source if we have alternatives. And that's why I think it's really important that FreeBSD continue to, to be a, a leading entity there so that we're not all trapped in the one bad place. Um. You mentioned something about monocultures, and GPL, I think, gave a bunch of people a bunch of headaches. Mm -hmm. And there's any number of GPL, GPL functions under that, that currently are part of FreeBSD. How's, how does that affect sort of development within, say, Juniper? Uh, 
GPL is is a, a big problem for us, uh, especially since we do we've done like signed binaries for almost 20 years now, um, which makes you know GPL v3 in particular uh, a complete no, um, and that's one of the reasons that we were fully on board with FreeBSD moving to Clang is because that we'd been stuck on GCC 4.2 for far longer than we would like. Uh, because it was the last compiler that was GPL2 and was usable by us. Um, any of the GPL v3 compilers were like a non-starter. Uh, so Clang's been wonderful in that respect. I was going to make a, a comment also on the the, um, the integration question. So when I when I joined Juniper, we had uh, we Junos was effectively a stock FreeBSD 2.2 something uh, with a couple of Juniper added packages on top of it. Uh, one for the routing stuff and one, f well, the routing and uh, management UI stuff and another one for the, the what we call it the peer fee, the, the, the packet engine stuff that does all the real work talking to our sexy hardware, um, which is very sexy by the way. Um, over, over time though, so uh, there were some problems with the way they built that, and one of the first jobs I got was to fix their build um, because they had, um, we were using CVS at the time, and they had two modules that you could check out, one for the, the kernel team, one for the PFE, and one for the everything else. And unbeknownst to the various developers in those teams, there was overlap in those modules. And so they would continually you know, shoot each other's feet off uh, as they made changes. So anyway, we fixed that, got an integrated build, and so on. And and while it, it's, it's really neat and, and uh, tempting to do a fully integrated your code with, say, the FreeBSD or whatever it is that you're using, because you can hack and slash anything you like and, and it all, quote, just works. Um, the, the, you pay for it, though, when you try to do an upgrade. So we did, we did uh, from 2.2 .2 to 4. Dot something, then to 5, then to 6. Um, and then we stopped because that last upgrade from five to six took over a dozen people almost two years um, and was very painful. So a number of us had been pushing for some time to like complete, to re-sever Junos from FreeBSD, use a stock FreeBSD, as close to stock FreeBSD as we can mm. and so on. It actually took um, Steve Kays, one of our, our guys, and, and, and Marcel, almost two years to do the, the grunt work of separating the things apart. No functional changes, just all the, the scut work of being able to, okay, now we can build a clean FreeBSD and um, Junos on top of it. Um, and the proof of the pudding is when we did the upgrade from what was effectively FreeBSD 9 to FreeBSD 10, it took two people one week versus a dozen people two years. Um, and uh, so that's, and, and we're now in the process of um, taking that further and going to, as far, uh, going to main, um, so that we're, we're continually integrating main into, into our process. Um, that's been a little bit painful because uh, we've, we're currently shipping, you know, stable 12 based timeline, so that's a few years worth of, of upstream work that we need to integrate and, and catch up on. But to, to Alan's you know point this morning, uh, you know, those of us who who you know like I, I fixed the the build bits and stuff like that. So it's actually in many cases easier and more attractive for me to go and make a change in upstream and then let it be pulled into our process um, afterwards than make the change internally and then try and sync it upstream. Because uh, as Alan was making the point before, you. Once you, to get it upstream, you've got to satisfy various people that, you know, the way it's going to work. So you know you're going to have to satisfy all those people before you get it in, so you might as well do that work first. Um, as long as you know that what I end up putting in upstream is going to be work for us, you know, when it comes in the back door, that's easier. And in fact, it ends up being a lot less work that way. So that, that's good. 
No, I think that's a key no before you go or no before you start working on this. Always build with upstream in mind, otherwise it's very easy to lag behind and the pain of having to constantly catch up is one of the things that will make you go, okay, enough. This just doesn't work. But I do want to press a little bit more on GPL because I know that's that's a pain for pretty much anybody in the community. Alex, what's what's been NetApp's, NetApp's experience with whatever pieces of GPL you had to deal with? And how does that change the, the route of a product and development? For us, you know, with GPL, you can't touch it, can't modify it all. You can ship it, which is fine, but you can't touch it which means that when there are issues that come up, whether it's a security issue or a bug, you're kind of out of luck. You gotta upgrade the entire thing as a unit that's been released, which slows everything down. So it's a major hindrance. Um, and anytime we can find software that's not GPL, it makes things a lot easier. Um, of course, it goes both ways, because now if you modify it, it makes it harder to merge forward and stay current. Um, but hot fixes are so much easier to apply. So it's kind of a double edge when you, when you have a permissive license where everyone in a monorepo can just go and modify that API however they want. Um, but overall, GPL just makes things clunky and it's dangerous and painful because you're stuck with something out of date that has a security vulnerability or you have to stop what you're doing to spend three weeks to fix it. Andy, from your contact with many communities, the Octo project, everything, how do you see the GPL annoyance? How is it like how is it received and can you wager a guess of why it's still being pushed in spite of what I can suspect is a lot of backlash? Um, so I think if you look at the various code hosting services, GitHub, GitLab, etc., um, they've done numerous surveys over what licenses are being used now that everyone's pretty much applying a license to the code. Um, and yeah, GPL is definitely on the wane, right? It's, it's not the predominant license that's used anymore. Um, regardless if you combine GPL 2, 3, Afera, GPL, etc., right? All the GPLs combined pale and consist, uh, in comparison to the likes of Apache 2.0. Right. Apache is definitely the predominant license that's used by most people. Um, and BSD three cores is actually pretty high up there as well now, right? Uh, alongside MIT. So those three are the, the dominant permissive licenses. Uh, and some have advantages over others. So if you have some code that is GPL licensed, as an example, um, and your new project or whatever needs to work with that old one, you can find a permissive license that will allow you to integrate together, right? Um, you do have to be a bit more careful with which license you pick, but it's doable. Hmm. Um, as ARM, we contribute to GPL projects like GCC, like Linux kernel, um, but they're almost the only projects we contribute to that are GPL licensed now, right? Um, and that is, there's an element of legacy there, but there's also the fact that um, a large number of our customers um, require uh, Linux support in one shape or another, whether it be for mobile, client, automotive, you name it, right? Uh, all the verticals that we work in, there's at least two major customers that require Linux, so we have to comply with that, so yeah. Um, but it is very few and far between. Um, I think I think GPL v3 was definitely the, the, the start of the decline, uh, and that was always the case. Uh, and you know, when v3 was being discussed, a lot of people logged complaints, Stallman didn't really care. He was carrying on anyway. Um, but yeah, I think um, the fact that FreeBSD is permissive licensed is a huge advantage. Uh, and it is one that people to this day still don't fully realize and understand. Right? Um, the fact that you've got this license, you can have a full operating system that if you 
have concerns, you don't have to share everything. It would be nice if you could, but um, there are areas where actually we can share 90% of our code. There's specific areas that are pattern encumbered, like media, etc. right? So you may want to avoid sharing that stuff. Um, but for the most part, base platform piece, yeah, it can all be opened up. Um, so I think that there's still plenty of legs left in, in FreeBSD for growth and, and expansion. So if I'm now on sort of in the, in, in the IoT space and I'm building sensors or any sort of smaller platforms, the license allows me to sort of build freely. The community is welcoming of me. Should I go ahead with FreeBSD? No, absolutely. Absolutely. There's, n there's no reason not to. Um, well, let me s rephrase that. Um, people will say, oh, but it doesn't support Kubernetes, as an example, right? Um, we're seeing Kubernetes being used predominantly, not just in the cloud space, but in smaller platforms, right? It's like, yeah, but it doesn't support Kubernetes. That's fine. You don't need to support Kubernetes. You need to support the APIs. So as long as we can have decent API support, it doesn't matter whether it's called Kubernetes or, or Bongo Netties, right? It makes no difference. Does it do the same function? Yes, great. Thank you very much. I'll go with that. So is that a, we're getting to the last question before I get kicked off the stage. Um, what are some common misconceptions around FreeBSD that maybe if you come from the outside, you have this silly idea and, you know, I'd like everybody on the panel to kind of address that in short. Go. But don't they still use SVN? <laughs> Trust me, I had that two weeks ago. Can you slightly more, again, for um, less yeah, knowledgeable I mean, audience? So it, some people view FreeBSD as being uh, very old, outdated, full of gray beards, et cetera. I, I've um, shaved my beard before, just so I, <laughs> you know, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's just one of those um, weird misconceptions for whatever reason, right? Uh, I mean, I've got a fairly large Linux kernel engineering team at ARM, um, and they have a great relationship with FreeBSD, right? Um, they'll go out drinking uh, quite regularly with, with the local FreeBSD folk in Cambridge and, and the pubs. It just so happens that we now have one of those beer drinking FreeBSD people in the pub working for us. Um, that's a by the by. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely the, a great platform to use. Uh, it's a great community to get engaged with. Uh, and yeah, do not be scared. Alex, one misconception. Misconception. Uh, that Linux is the only kernel you can do development on. Like in, in university, it seems to be the, the classic thing that you learn in systems uh, class that, hey, we're going to do some kernel module development, so let's go get Linux and start hacking away. It's like, oh, but there's others. There's, wh what about all the different BSDs? Like, what do you mean? It's dead. It's not around. No, it's very much alive, very much modern. Um, yeah, kind of just going along with it. It's not, it's not dead and old. It's, it's very state of the art. Simon? Yeah, I think I think the you know all the cool kids are doing Linux is is the the main thing too. Name one. Sorry. Name one cool kid that's doing Linux. No, no, no. I, I didn't <laughs> say it's true. I just said that's the perception. You know, like, I, and I've heard this from like you know senior execs and so on. Um, they may not have used those words, but that's what they meant. Um, you know, like, oh, we need to get we need to get onto Linux because you know that's what all the cool kids are doing. So, well, yeah. I mean, there's there's all sorts of things you could say to that there. Probably none of them are politically correct, so I'll, I'll skip that bit. But um, that is a that is something to to. So we, you all need to work on your cool factor, okay, guys? Um, so that we can say no, no, no. The cool guys still do BSD. Door, <coughs> short and sweet. Thank you. Um, so so first of all, just on the license thing, it's not GPL at least for us. It's GPL v3 and a Faro. Um, we have no problem with GPL v2, and we take our open source compliance very seriously. Um, but in terms of misconceptions, 
um, you know, I've been dealing with the same issues that you guys have been dealing with about um, Linux envy um, from people who aren't personally involved in code. And in order to market their ideas, they invent stuff and, and sell these stories internally. And one of the stories is that developing on Linux is 10 times as fast as, as FreeBSD development. Um, and it's, it's interesting that people have to resort to fantasy because they can't ground their arguments in technical reality. I think for me, it was the, the misconception that led me to, to work with Sabina to start Clara, which was people saying, I can't find someone to build this FreeBSD code for me. I need to build something, and I couldn't find someone. Wasn't it technically an actual thing about five or six years ago? I suppose, but that, that misconception is, is not true now, and I think that's the one that still seems to be very pervasive, that if you need some code for FreeBSD, good luck finding someone, and it's very much a misconception. I think just to sum up, and then we'll close, the. If you want to get into FreeBSD with your platform, obviously there's a lot of support. There's big companies supporting this. Uh, you don't have that level of sort of overlordship over a project that's more a contributive uh, style. And also the whole idea of whether the, the, it, the, the biggest misconception that I find is you can't run in this, this in the enterprise because when it fails, you have nobody to call. Again, this isn't Ghostbusters. It, it, isn't, it isn't the movie, it isn't the challenge. It, you just have to sort of reach out. Yes, it's not as common as reaching out to Red Hat Enterprise, or maybe not as common as all of the small companies that have spawned. But at the same time, there's also far more reliability in the system. There's also far less wishy-washy attitude towards better service. Everybody on the panel has attested to the fact today that in the end, if you need something, if you want to put something new as part of a new FreeBSD release, that's entirely possible. So with that, I think the FreeBSD community, the, the foundation, and by the way, do watch and or watch, follow, participate in Andy's talk tomorrow at what time? 10.30, 10 .30 tomorrow. 30. He's a great speaker, so I'm, I'm definitely plugging for that one. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>